spent most of my life in Billy and Jenny. Welcome to another edition of the Bosworth Lecture Series. This evening with a presentation from Neville Plant, author of American Jezebel, a definitive biography on Anne Hutchison, a dissident Puritan crusader, and the only woman founder of the colony in her time. Uh, thanks tonight especially to Reverend Nancy and her first congregational family for embracing the Bosworth Lecture Series. And we look to come back in June for a presentation of a patriotic nature and learn more of the public role this church played in establishing our July 4th observation. While most of us know at least some of the story of Roger Williams, banished to found his religious colony of Providence, few know the courageous story of Anne Hutchison, banished from Boston and sent to settle nearby in Portsmouth, where she lived at the west end of Island Park Cove, where we all take the sharp turn left off Boyd's Lane to jump onto Route 24 North. <laughs> How many of you knew this before tonight? <laughs> well, that's almost half a third. Um, uh, there, yeah, there she continued um, her meetings, preaching to her followers a covenant of grace in contrast to the Orthodox Puritan covenant of works. I'll let Eve elaborate on the difference. But Anne's dissenting views went beyond religion to establish her as an outspoken woman in a time of male domination. <laughs> she didn't own the property, for example. It was her husband who owned the property. Women could own property at that time. Tonight, Eve will highlight Anne's contributions and the implications of her outspoken views in a world where free speech remains under siege and women continue to break barriers. Eve is a descendant of Anne Hutchison herself. And for full disclosure, I am Winthrop Dual Fulton. I come down from John Winthrop, the fellow who banished her to <laughs> here in Portsmouth. Eve and, I, Eve and I have had a good laugh over that. <laughs> I think it's very appropriate. Um, a, a descendant of Anne Hutchison herself, as well as a Massachusetts Book Award winner, Eve has written a number of books, her latest, Who Needs a Statue? Interestingly enough, about statues of people of color and women, including Anne Hutchison herself. And uh, with that introduction, please welcome tonight's guest speaker, Eve LaPlante. Eve? Thank you very much. This story begins with my Aunt Charlotte. Like many of you, I had an older relative who cared deeply about the history of our family, learning about it and sharing it. Charlotte May Wilson, my grandfather's sister, spent decades driving around New England and parts of Europe in search of the records of her ancestors, which she compiled in a very large family tree. She graduated from Smith, served as a Red Cross nurse during the First World War, worked as a social worker, and ran an inn at the tip of Cape Cod. A feisty woman with Unitarian and Victorian sensibilities, she wore a dress, silk stockings, and leather shoes to the beach. As a child, I often visited Aunt Charlotte in her little red house across the road from her inn. Days we would go to the beach. In the evenings, I would sit on the floor of her, of her living room, playing with the wind-up toys she kept on the windowsill, listening to her cluck over her ancestors like a hen over her brood. One memorable ancestor was a woman so fierce and terrifying that the first governor of Massachusetts, DeWolf's ancestor, brought her to trial for heresy. I didn't know what heresy was, except it was bad and banished her from the colony. She slouched away, I imagined. I had no idea she'd gone on to co-found a colony. And then she was murdered by Native Americans. The Indians scalped her, Aunt Charlotte told me, and all her little children, too, 
she added ominously. Another ancestor was a Salem witch judge who realized his mistake and repented for hanging innocent people as witches. He wore penitential sackcloth for the rest of the life and became something of a feminist, according to Aunt Charlotte, who clearly loved the witch judge best. These ancestors seemed to be present and familiar to her as if they were her friends, but they frightened and embarrassed me. For many years, I gave no thought to Aunt Charlotte's stories. Only later, when I had young children, did I return to them and wonder if they could possibly be true. Was there really a Salem witch judge who became a feminist and an abolitionist? You can switch. There was, alone among the wealthy, powerful men of, the, of Boston in the year 1700, Judge Samuel Sewell spoke out and wrote against slavery. When one in five Boston families owned slaves, Samuel Sewell published and wrote America's First Abolitionist Tract. In a later essay, which is much less well known, he made the revolutionary argument that women are inherently equal to men almost 200 years before women could vote. Then there was that, aunt, that woman banished from Massachusetts. What on earth did she do to be such a threat? Was she really scalped along with all her little children? I could no longer ask Aunt Charlotte, who died when I was 22. I had to read the historical record. And the more I learned about the ancestors she had described, the more I understood her fascination with them. This led me to research and write three of their biographies, Salem Witch Judge, Marmy and Louisa, oh, you got it. Marmy and Louisa about Louisa May Alcott and her mother, and American Jezebel. I wrote the biographies chronologically, starting with the woman who was banished in the 17th century. Who was Anne Hutchinson, and where did she come from? Anne Marbury was born in rural England in the summer of 1591 during the reign of the first Queen Elizabeth in a town called Alford in the county of Lincolnshire, about a five-hour drive north of London near the North Sea. Her parents were Puritans, reformers who valued preaching above the sacraments and followed Calvin's teachings about salvation and grace. Her father, Francis Marbury, was a rebellious minister of the Church of England. In his early 20s, he was arrested and jailed for verbally attacking bishops, for being corrupt, and for assigning poorly educated ministers to preach. He was tried and convicted of heresy, just as his daughter was later, in his case, by the Ecclesiastical Court of High Commission in 1578, and he spent two years in Marshalsea Prison in London. After that, he moved north to the town of Alford to preach in St. Wilfred's Church and to teach boys in the Alford Free Grammar School. Uh, can you go to the church? Yeah. This was his church. It's still there. And there's that gothic arch doorway, and just above that is the second floor schoolroom. That was the school, and a minister had the duty to, to teach the boys of the town as well as to preach to the congregation of the community. And that was right where he taught. Um, a few years later, when Anne was a toddler, the Reverend Marbury again ran afoul of church authorities for preaching nonconformity and questioning the bishop's judgment. This time, he was placed under house arrest for a few years, prohibited from teaching or preaching. The one small advantage of his confinement was that he was at home and available and present to teach his little girls who could not attend school. Anne's mother, Bridget Dryden, a first, poet, poet, a, sorry, a first cousin of the poet John Dryden, was a midwife. Midwives enjoyed some public power because they went around saving the lives of babies and women and comforting the dying. Many women died in childbirth then, and nearly one in two children died before their fifth birthday. 
So a nurse midwife with a good record was held in high esteem by women and men alike. Anne Marbury was a bright, inquisitive older child in a large family who showed promise in both of her parents' professions. Now it was natural, even expected, the girl might grow up to become a midwife like her mother, but it was not per permissible for any woman to, to become a minister, to preach, to teach men, or even to speak in public. Anne was so gifted, though, that she found ways to follow in her father's steps. He taught her Latin and some Greek and Hebrew and how to understand and explain to other people what scripture means. She also inherited from him a defiant self-confidence, a trait we know about from a transcript that he wrote of his trial at St. Paul's in London when he was a young man, a transcript he shared with his children. In it, the Bishop of London asks him, what have you to say to us? And the young minister replies, nothing but God save you all for you and all the bishops of England are guilty of the death of every soul that perishes by the ignorance of the ministers. <laughs> when the bishop asked Marbury how the church could afford the livings for better educated ministers, he replied, a man might cut a good large thong out of your hide and it would never be missed, implying that the greed and self-indulgence of the bishop impoverished the church. Almost 30 years, no, I don't, we're okay with the slides. Almost 30 years later, when Anne was 14 and the new Bishop of London was more tolerant of Puritans, her father was offered a vicarage in London. The family moved from Alford to London where her father preached for several years before dying when Anne was 19. Her mother and siblings all remained in London, but Anne, decided to marry her childhood sweetheart, William Hutchinson of, of Alford, and return to Alford and start a family. She was soon known around the town for her skill at interpreting scripture before other women. Now, teaching was acceptable for a Puritan woman, so long as it was done in private at home, and women's meetings were called conventicles they were similar to the meetings often held by Puritan families and neighbors for praying, repeating sermons, reading the catechism, and singing psalms. Women were not directed to run them, and they were officially banned from running them, but the line between mother and preacher blurred in a culture that encouraged these activities. Anne gained respect for her ability to help women answer their religious questions in scripture meetings and at their bedsides during childbirth. Her success as a mother, she raised 15 children, also brought her respect. There was something else noteworthy about Anne. She had the complete support of her husband, a successful mercer who owned a shop, a textile shop in Alford's Market Square. Countless women in history have supported their husband's work, but there are few husbands like Will who provided the emotional and financial support that enabled her to assume a kind of public power. Another reason why Anne Hutchinson could function as a de facto minister was her close working relationship with the most famous Puritan preacher of her time. And John Cotton gained fame for his lengthy sermons, two or three hours long, which attracted large crowds of Puritans to St. Batolph's Church in Boston, Lincolnshire, where he began his career as a minister in 1612. That's the exterior and the interior. It's the, one of the largest parish churches in England. Anne and Will encountered his preaching early in their marriage when they went preacher hunting, as Puritans often did, rather than settling for whoever their local preacher happened to be, as the state church required. We can go backwards now, maybe. Anne Hutchinson greatly admired John Cotton, as many Puritans did. What was unusual was that he admired and respected her in return. Like most educated men of his day, he considered, he considered women inherently incapable of preaching or teaching. Complex discord, 
deep thought and books were too much for a woman's weak mind which, and would keep her from pleasing her husband, her intellectual superior. But he had to make an exception for Anne, who was not only as devout a Calvinist as he, sharing his belief in unmerited grace, but also a brilliant teacher. He made her part of his inner circle of believers in Boston, and he encouraged her to teach other parishioners, men as well as women. After many years of collaboration, John Cotton credited Anne with preparing souls for him to convert. Quote, Mistress Hutchinson has more people resort to her for counsel about matters of conscience and clearing up men's spiritual estates than any minister. He effectively gave her a public voice, something no woman then could expect to have. We go back to the Boston stump. Their collaboration lasted almost 20 years in this town of Boston, which is about 20 miles south of Alford. It's the, the capital of this, this region, the main town. During this time, Puritan ministers like Cotton were increasingly being harassed by the Church of England for their, for their non-conformity. For example, for not kneeling at communion, not crossing themselves, or performing other rituals that they considered too Catholic, for removing crosses and religious art from their churches. Many of Cotton's colleagues had to leave England during this time to escape being tried, censured, silenced, and even imprisoned by the church. Cotton lasted longer than most because of his unusual talent for appearing to comply with bishops with whom he disagreed. Even after members of his congregation broke into St. Patolph's one night, that church, in 1621 to smash stained glass windows and statues and tear down tapestries, Cotton avoided any censure. This made him the envy of his colleagues. As one said in 1629, I envy Mr. Cotton of Boston most because he does nothing in way of conformity to the church and yet has his liberty. And I do everything that way and cannot enjoy mine. This changed in 1632 when a deeply anti-Puritan Bishop of London named William Laud, who was later Archbishop of Canterbury, summoned John Cotton to the Court of High Commission to answer to the charge of nonconformity. Rather than a risk, arrest, trial, and jail, Cotton shed his clerical garments and disappeared into the Puritan underground. He was now 48 years old, with a 27-year-old wife pregnant with his first child, and he felt he had no choice but to go into exile, either in Holland, the West Indies, or New England. He decided to go to Boston, Massachusetts, where some men of his congregation had settled and the governor, John Winthrop, DeWolf's ancestor, had sent him a welcoming invitation. There was even talk that Boston in Massachusetts was named in Cotton's honor because he was the vicar of Boston. So in the summer of 1633, Cotton and his wife sailed to the New World on a ship that also carried two young men named Edward Hutchinson who were seeking their fortunes in the New World, which was Anne and Will's eldest son, about 20, and Will's younger, younger brother, youngest brother, who was a few years older. Back, oh, I, that's showing you where they went. I'm back going back to England now. Back in England, Anne felt the loss of her firstborn child and her teacher. Without John Cotton, she told Will, there was no minister left in England she trusted except for their brother-in-law, John Wheelwright, who was himself now in hiding and considering leaving England. There were other strains on her. In her early 40s, she was again pregnant, and she was still reeling from the deaths of two of her daughters from the plague, which had, slept, had swept through Alford in the summer of 1630. She nursed neighbors and their children, and then her own children, who all sur survived except for two daughters, ages 16 and 8. She prayed for months before deciding to emigrate. And in June of 1634, seven months after the birth of her youngest daughter, Susan, 
Anne and Will and their 10 children and several servants boarded the ship, the Griffin, for the long trip across the Atlantic. They arrived in Boston, Massachusetts on September 18, 1634, nearly four centuries ago. We can do a close up now. Things started out well. They built a large wood frame house in the center of Boston. Will sold fine textiles from a lean to beside the house. He was elected a magistrate of the great and general court of Massachusetts, the colony's highest authority. The children thrived. The boys attended Boston Latin School. Anne gave birth to her youngest son and continued working as midwife and teacher. Anne and Will were admitted as full members to the first church in Boston, which was the forerunner of the Congregational Church, founded by John Cotton. He was delighted to have Anne Hutchinson back at his side. He wrote, Anne Hutchinson was well respected and esteemed of me. She did much good in our town, in women's meetings, at child travails, wherein she was not only skillful and helpful, but readily fell into good discourse with the women about their spiritual estates. Her Bible talks attracted crowds of women and eventually men who started following their wives to her meetings. Her audiences often numbered 80 men and women, which was nearly one in five adults in the town of Boston, who stood or sat on benches or on the floor in her living room. By 1636, less than two years after she'd arrived, she was running two evening meetings a week in her large parlor. She sat before the crowd, her Bible open to the passage she was discussing, and analyzed for her listeners the mysteries of God's grace and salvation and the recent sermons of the local ministers, those she admired and those she did not. You can this presented problems for John Winthrop, the colony's founder and first governor, who saw danger in her powers. In the summer of 1636, at the start of the Pequot War, he couldn't get enough young men from Boston to enlist as soldiers because Hutchinson was telling her followers the war was wrong. I also believe, and this is somewhat conjecture, that she was opposed to his decision at the end of that summer and the next summer to enslave Pequot captives. And that was another issue between the two of them. They lived, their houses were very, very close together. Um, and he was beginning in, you know, the, the practice of slavery in Massachusetts Bay Colony, starting with the captives from the Pequot War. Um, Local ministers were complaining to him that Hutchinson was questioning their teachings in her meetings, saying that they were preaching a covenant of works rather than the Calvinist covenant of grace. One minister told Winthrop that members of Hutchinson's audience, quote, tainted by her teaching, conveyed the infection to others, including some magistrates, gentlemen, scholars, and men of learning, burgesses of our general court, captains and soldiers, chief men in towns. Another minister of Salem said Hutchinson had, quote, stepped out of her place. She had rather been a husband than a wife, and a preacher than a hearer, and a magistrate than a subject. Winthrop told Cotton of his concerns. Cotton defended Hutchinson, saying she and he were of one mind and setting up a meeting between her and the aggrieved ministers to smooth things over and convince the other ministers she was doing nothing wrong. Winthrop could still see danger in her ability to attract a following of influential citizens eager for social reform. In his writing, he described her as a vile woman of a fierce carriage, a nimble wit, and a very voluble tongue who was not fit for our society, an ally of Satan, and finally, this American Jezebel, referring to the ancient Israeli queen widely considered the most evil woman in the Bible. Desperate to stop her, he called her before the general court on a charge of heresy and sedition, and arranged for her trial to be held in the town of Cambridge, where she had fewer followers than in Boston. 
Early on a chilly Tuesday in November 1637, Anne and Will Hutchinson left their house, walked to the ferry crossing the Charles River, and walked a few miles to a meeting house in modern day Harvard Square. All that day and most of the next day, the male judges of the court interrogated her. She was now 46 and pregnant for the 16th time. She was allowed no counsel and expected to stand throughout the trial, yet she defended herself brilliantly, parrying every charge that she'd behaved in a manner not tolerable or fitting for her sex. That was the charge. When Winthrop demanded she explain where she found her authority to run meetings and teach crowds, she didn't challenge the belief that woman's power is private, but used it in her defense. Citing Paul's letter to Titus, she said, I conceive there lies a clear rule in Titus that the elder women should instruct the younger, and then I must have a time wherein I must do it. She cited the Acts of the Apostles, where a married couple take upon them to instruct Apollos, a man of good parts, but they, better instructed, might teach him. Winthrop mocked her. See how your argument stands? Priscilla, with her husband, took Apollo home to instruct him privately. Therefore, Mistress Hutchinson, without her husband, may teach 60 or 80? She replied, I call them not, but if they come to me, I may instruct them. He said, yet you show us not a rule from scripture. She said, I have given you two places in scripture. He said, but neither of them will suit your practice. Her calm dissolving into sarcasm, she pointed at the Bible she held and asked the men of the court, must I show my name written therein? Furious, he brought up 1 Corinthians 14 in which Paul admonishes all women to be silent in church and 1 Timothy 2 which says, I permit not a woman to teach, neither to usurp authority over man, but to be in silence. She responded by asking, if any come to my house to be instructed in the ways of God, what rule have I to put them away? Do you think it not lawful for me to teach women? And she couldn't resist adding, why do you call me to teach the court? We do not call you to teach the court, he said. We do not mean to discourse with those of your sex. And that, in fact, was true. In this society, women had no public function. In Puritan theology, in fact, the sole function of a woman is to reproduce. These constraints on women's power presented a legal paradox for the court. If a woman, by definition, has no public role, how can she be charged with a crime against the state? Things were going well for Anne. The court called John Cotton to testify. He said she'd done nothing wrong. Her supporters crowding the back of the meeting house hoped Mistress Hutchinson could escape the court's judgment and go free. Things changed on the afternoon of the second day when Anne began to tell the court about her spiritual and intellectual journey in England and America, which she called the ground of what I know to be true. In public, to express her own beliefs, demonstrating a belief in the power of the individual conscience and a commitment to the right of every individual to speak his or her mind. In effect, she was opening the door to her Bible classes and inviting the judges in to hear her teach. This was extraordinary and against the law. In an era when no woman could vote, hold public office, teach outside her home, sign a legal document, or even speak in church, Anne Hutchinson had the courage to speak her mind despite the consequences which were great. Governor Winthrop banged the gavel and called for a vote on the charges against her. All but two of the 40 judges raised their hands to banish her for behaving in a manner not fitting for her sex. Cotton was briefly called back by the judges and the other ministers who wanted to give him a chance to show 
which side he was on. Seeing she was doomed, he abandoned her, suddenly remembering having worried on occasion that she was too proud because she strengthened her faith through private meditations apart from the public ministry. A historian would later write of John Cotton, he saw the light but did not stop it being extinguished. Anne Hutchinson was banished for telling the court the ground of what she knew to be true. Instead of conforming to the status quo and staying silent, she defended the right to free speech and the power of the individual conscience to determine what is true, which is still today a fundamental, if controversial, virtue in this country. If that were her only contribution to American history, it would make her one of America's founding mothers, if America had founding mothers. <laughs> Hutchinson also had a founding role in higher education as the midwife of Harvard College. Only a week after her trial, the Massachusetts court ordered the building of the college as a way of enforcing orthodoxy and preventing a charismatic radical like her from ever again holding sway in the town. And there's more, as many of you know. In exile, she became the only woman ever to co-found an American colony. After her expulsion from Massachusetts, she walked 60 miles south with 70 relatives, friends, and followers who accompanied her voluntarily to create a new settlement dedicated to freedom of worship and speech. That was Portsmouth, Rhode Island, which 19 Englishmen had just purchased from Narragansett Indians. These 19 men, her husband, older sons, and sons-in-law, and strongest male supporters, made this purchase on her behalf because a woman could not sign a legal document or own land. Their explicit aim, which the men defined in a document called the Portsmouth Compact, was to create a community in which people could believe and speak and worship as their consciences demanded. They planned to create an independent colony with a regular government in which all people might worship God according to the dictates of their conscience. One of their rules was no person within the said colony shall be in any ways molested, punished, disquieted, or called into question on matter of religion. This was to be a place where Anne could speak her mind, even preach, without fear of banishment. 25 years later, when that settlement, Rhode Island, merged with Providence Plantation to become a colony, the concept of freedom of conscience, championed by Hutchinson and Roger Williams, was enshrined in the new colony's charter. And more than a century later, that religious freedom clause contributed to the clause in the Bill of Rights, quote, government shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech. In the freer settlement of Rhode Island, Anne and her family lived for three years in a house on Island Park Cove at the west end near the Boyd's Lane entry ramp to Route 24. And this gentleman, uh, who was the police chief uh, 20 years ago, retired police chief 20 years ago and a local historian, um, took me down through the woods here. I don't, you, many of you may know this place. And showed me the place uh, in the distance where her settlement was. Brown University archeologists had ex excavated the beach in the 70s and they knew that this is where the people had lived. Um, so we can, uh, there's a couple of images. That's him taking me, I don't know if you know that street, but taking me and keep, you can go, keep going. And that was, that's from the highway, looking out with the arrow showing where it actually is on the beach. Um, and then we can keep going. And then we, he had said, you have to go by boat. So I rented a kayak and with, that's two of my daughters, we kayaked to the beach. There's no way to walk to it. Um, so that was quite amusing for them. And we went, and that's, that's what it looks like close up. Um, I think that's, is that, that's, yeah, you can leave that. From time to do, time, while she was on Rhode Island, Governor Winthrop threatened her by sending men to demand she apologize for her crimes. 
Each time this happened, Will defended her, calling her a dear saint and servant of God. In 1642, after more than 30 years of marriage and 15 children, Will Hutchinson died at 55. This great personal loss made Anne even more vulnerable in English society, and not long afterwards, three ministers from Boston knocked on her door and said the Bay Colony was planning to annex Rhode Island. Her oldest son, Edward, who'd stayed in Boston, sent her a warning that the Massachusetts court was going to send troops to take over Rhode Island by royal charter or military force. Realizing she had to move again, Anne sent a letter to Dutch authorities in New, Ham in New Amsterdam. The Dutch were more accepting than the English of religious differences. She asked their permission to build a house for herself and her younger children in the Bronx. Permission was granted. The Dutch had heard of this brave English woman. So she and seven of her younger children moved to modern day New York City where they lived in a farmhouse alongside a river that is now known as the Hutchinson River. At the time she moved to the Bronx, there was a war going on between the Dutch and Lenape Indians. The following summer, Lenape warriors raided the Dutch settlement in which the Hutchinsons lived, an act of retaliation for the murder of some Indians by Dutch soldiers. This war went on for five years. Mistaking the Hutchinsons for a Dutch family, the Indians did indeed scalp Anne and six of her children. Then they burned their bodies and their cattle in the house. As the warriors departed the smoldering settlement, they found Anne's nine-year-old daughter, Susan, hiding, terrified, inside the gap of a large glacial rock. Susan, the youngest girl in the family, born just, at, just before the family left Alford, England, was away from the house picking blueberries during the massacre, which she witnessed from her hiding place, the split rock. The Indians seized her and took her with them. The sachem, Wampaj, spoke enough English to learn from her the true identity of the family he had killed. Horrified by his mistake, he renamed himself Anne Hook in honor of Anne Hutchinson. He adopted and raised Susan, who spent the next nine years living with the Lenape until she returned to Boston at 18 married an Englishman, and returned to Rhode Island. In addition to Susan, Anne left five older children and more than 30 grandchildren. Her descendants multiplied and include Thomas Hutchinson, governor of Massachusetts during the Revolutionary War, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, the Romneys, and at least three presidents, Franklin, Roosevelt, and both Bushes. Until recently, an entire wall of the Family History Library in Salt Lake City was devoted to the descendants of Anne Hutchinson. But her legacy goes beyond gene genealogy. The seeds of the ongoing struggle for civil rights can be found in her life. By standing up to the leaders of early New England, defying their belief that a woman may not wield public power, Anne Hutchinson became both a champion for inclusive democracy and also a symbol of America's exclusion of women from public power. In, according to a plaque on a bronze statue of Anne Hutchinson that stands in front of the Massachusetts State House, she was a courageous exponent of civil liberty and religious toleration. She certainly has a hold on me, as she did on my Aunt Charlotte. It has been 20 years since I wrote American Jezebel, and I'm writing about her still. She appears in my latest book, just published by Tilbury House, a picture book about statues of people of color and women, co-authored by Margie Burns Knight and illustrated by the artist Alix Delinois. In front of the Massachusetts State House, Anne Hutchinson protects her daughter. An English immigrant who had 15 children, Anne was a popular teacher in the 1630s when it was against the law for a woman to teach men. The governor of Massachusetts told her to stop teaching. She didn't. 
the governor, and more than 30 judges, all men, brought her to court, tried and convicted her, jailed her, and kicked her out of Massachusetts for teaching men. With her family and friends, Anne walked 60 miles to a settlement she started on Rhode Island, where she continued to teach, as she still does. Thank you very much. And if people have questions or comments, I would be happy to um, take that now. In the back, yeah. What's the relation between Anne and Roger Williams? Who came to Rhode Island first? How did they meet, talk to each other, influence each other? Well, Roger Williams was banished by John Winthrop and the court, the same court that banished Anne, two years before Anne. Um, and he was sent in, it was the winter time. He, he was warned by Winthrop, you're about to be banished. And he ran basically south and settled in Providence. Um, and he maintained from then on a very close relationship with Winthrop and other judges of the court. They, there are many letters back and forth between them. He, he sort of kept his connection with the powerful men of Mass Bay Colony. Um, two years later, when she was banished, it was also the winter, t beginning of the winter, but because she was frail and a female, they said, she had to be arrest, put in house arrest over the winter until the spring. She wasn't supposed to go until the spring came. So they, they put her under house arrest in Roxbury, away from her family and her followers, basically isolated her several miles from her home. And then in the spring, she was actually, she was first excommunicated from the first church in Boston, and then a several day trial which John Cotton led. And then she went to Rhode Island. Now, the men who represented her, the family and friends of hers I described, had negotiated the purchase of uh, Quidneck Island from the Narragansett Indians with the aid of Roger Williams, who was already here. Um, I don't believe that she ever met Roger Williams, but probably her husband and some of those men who that winter were going back and forth and starting this rudimentary settlement on the beach that you saw um, would have negotiated with, with Williams. Um, but, and as, as I've said, unlike Williams, she was also banished, but she was completely cast out by the court and um, they were sending documents to England to say how terrible it was and they, how they had to get rid of her because they were worried that this would look bad, that they were banishing, you know, women who were important members of society and with a merchant husband. So um, it was a completely different kind of treatment than Roger Williams received. Uh, but, but he was just doing something very similar two years earlier and he was going to assist her, her, the men who represented her. It's possible they met, I just don't think there's any, maybe somebody here would know, but I don't think there's any evidence that she would have met Roger Williams. Any other questions or, yeah? Yeah, where are her remains if she had a stone somewhere? And is there a portrait of her? Um, I think because the house was burned with the bodies in it, there were no remains. And um, you know, the daughter was taken away and actually did very well for the, you know, in this, with this adopted family. Um, but uh, I don't believe there was any funeral or burial or anything there in New York. I mean, we have that stone, um, that split rock, which we know is right next to, near where her house was, just out of sight of the house. Um, and then, um, as far as what she looked like, there certainly are no portraits of her. Uh, we have, you know, portraits of Winthrop and Cotton and many of the other important men of the time. Um, and there's no portrait of her husband I'm aware of. He was a very modest kind of a man, I think. And, um, um, we know that she wasn't beautiful because John Winthrop in his diary would have described her as comely, like Mary Dyer was comely. If she were ugly, he would have said that because he did it of other women. So given that he said nothing about her appearance, he talked about her, you know, her wit and her volubility, 
He said nothing. She was probably ordinary looking, is all we really know. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, yeah, I think she was a traditionalist. I think she was a devout Calvinist. I think she was trying to, uh, she and Cotton were trying to bring the, uh, the sort of law and order mentality of the ministers who were supporting the judges of the court back from this covenant of works, which really isn't Calvinism at all, back to this idea of unmerited grace. So she was very, you know, uh, devout in her Calvinism. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't think she would have felt, described herself as a feminist. I also think that she had a very deep sense of somehow of the fundamental um, equality of all souls and that, um, that a great injustice was being done to her. But in the way that we think of feminism, no. She was, she was quite conservative. But on the other hand, you think about the character of her father, who was defiant, you know, this 23-year-old man talking back to the Bishop of London, you know, very impertinently. So there's that as well. And, you know, the Puritans were fighting against the, the powers of the church for a long time, and eventually were going to take over England when they, you know, the Cromwellians. Um, so it's a complicated thing, but yes, I think she, um, as I said, when she was arguing, she was just defending what she was doing in terms of Paul's writings. And she said, well, if Paul said women should do this, I should do this. And why would you try to stop me? But it just, um, it was bumping up against uh, the political realities. And Winthrop was trying to create something that wasn't going to fall apart. And he saw her as uh, a risky figure in that endeavor. Yeah. No, I, I, I think um, there may be more known, and I felt badly. I did talk to James Garman, who was a prominent local historian um, at the time. He was very generous. Um, I've always felt a little bad about that, that there isn't more. And I, I would hope that perhaps people in um, Portsmouth have discovered more. I mean, we have the, the, the remains of her midden from the settlement that was uh, excavated. Um, you know, all we have of record of her life is her birth in that church in England, her marriage to Will, which was in a church in London. Um, we don't have any record of her death, but we know from Winthrop's, Winthrop's journal when it was. And we have four days of testimony, two days in the court in Harvard Square, and two days in the Church of Boston in what is now downtown Boston. And these were documents being written by people that were trying to destroy her. That is all we know about her, really. I mean, we know she came here. But um, she left nothing of her own, and as I said, no portrait. So um, I feel like maybe there's more to be discovered about her time in Rhode Island. I don't know, is there anybody here who, who knows whether there is? for a covenant of faith or a covenant of grace right. as opposed to a covenant of works. Right. I wonder if you could explain the difference and why she chose to go with the covenant of grace as opposed well, to a covenant of grace. Any Calvinist would go with the covenant of grace. That was the fundamental belief of Calvinism and Puritanism, that um, grace 
comes to you without your doing anything. It's unmerited and you have no control and it, it really doesn't matter what your works are. And that was in contrast to the, what they viewed as the wrong Catholic view that you could go to mass and you know, pay money to the church and buy indulgences and you could do good deeds and you could earn salvation through your works. That was always gonna be not a good thing. And the reason that the ministers around Winthrop, you know, a lot of the ministers in early Boston were preaching a covenant of works is that's how you control people. You have to do the right things, follow our rules. We just created all these rules. We're trying to write laws as quickly as we can and we're you know, passing out parcels of a thousand acres to people that do what we want or each other. The amazing donation, you know, gifts of land in these early years. And um, so they, they were trying to control people in the congregations and they were preaching a covenant of works. Um, but it was politically helpful to them. So she was just saying, this isn't who we are. And, jo and John Cotton was saying the same thing. But when it came to him actually having to move again and go into exile again, he, he didn't want to do that. So um, he kind of, you know, he was very clever even in England in, in escaping um, punishment for his um, very unorthodox views, very non-conform. I mean, like I said, his parishioners in Boston and Lincolnshire went in and smashed up the church. Like, a lot of stuff, which seems terrible now, but that was, they thought they were purifying the church. And, um, and he got away with it. Bishop called him in and he, you know, he said, we'll clean everything up. So he, he was able to get away with it. Right here? Well, yeah, John, I mean, uh, Hawthorne, when he wrote that, um, used Anne Hutchinson as a model for Hester Prynne. And he says that in the preface. Um, he, he has a whole, you know, he had all his fireside story. He wrote all these stories about Puritans and he was descended from one of the Salem witch judges. I mean, he kind of created a 19th century cinematic picture of what colonial Boston had been like 200 years earlier. And, and he used her in that book as a model for Prynne. But, um, but it's, it's, it's sort of like a, it's a fictional uh, creation. It's wonderful, but it, it doesn't tell us anything about what was happening back in the 17th century. So I think when you read Hawthorne, you sometimes feel you're reading history, but you're reading literature. So Susan, <coughs> the remaining child, the only surviving child, she, there's no story from her. Oh, well, we know about her life in Rhode Island, yes. She came back here at 18 with her husband who was the son of the innkeeper who lived next to her family where her, her oldest brother, Edward, was still in Boston. Several of the daughters were, were in Boston um, and several came to Rhode, stayed in Rhode Island, the older ones. But we know that I think Susan had 15 children and there are many people around here descended from her. Apparently, it's been passed down through the centuries that she had bright red hair uh, which I believe, because that's the sort of thing that would, would get passed down. Um, people have told me this. Um, and then we know about her brother, Edward. He was killed in, um, in um, King Philip's War. And um, we know about, there were a couple of other children who had um, her daughter, Faith, and I think the daughter, Bridget, also had families. We know all like the dates and names. And None of them left diaries about their mother or any of their lives. I don't know about diaries. I mean, one of her sons-in-law, I think, and one of her grandsons was for a time governor of Rhode Island, and they were, and her great-grandson was Thomas Hutchinson, the loyalist governor of Massachusetts during the Revolutionary War. But um, there's a really good novel, actually, about Susan Hutchinson that I recommend called Trouble's Daughter. And, and uh, it's quite good, but again, it's like Hawthorne. It's, I mean, it's a novel. So, um, but I think it's very historically, um, you know, it's making an effort to get the facts right. I'm reading several books um, about the midwives back in the 1600s, 1700s, and they all kept their daily diaries. But we 
know if everything was burned, but she kept the jewelry there. Yeah, everything that survived that came from England to this to Boston and then from Boston to Rhode Island and then it went to the Bronx, it would have all burned. What was left? And you don't even know what that was. I mean, the son Edward was in the house. He stayed in the home and probably property like furniture and things were passed down through the male descendants to Thomas Hutchinson, the governor, who was a wealthy man of Boston, you know, three generations later, um, but we don't, nothing about, of her journals has survived. And, and she herself didn't, didn't stay in Boston, only Edward did. All of her older children who spoke, some of her sons spoke in her trials, they were all extremely loyal to her and they, they, we have some of their words in the trial transcripts, um, trying to, to show support but not succeeding. Yeah. Twenty years out Well, I, I think it w I would like to know more about her life in Rhode Island, um, and I I don't know if more has been discovered. Um, I'm not sure, I mean, you always want to redo something that you've written and, and make it better. Uh, there are certain things about it I wish I hadn't said it the way I said it, but um, no, I think the main thing that feels like there wasn't enough was the, was the Rhode Island bit. Of course, almost nothing about the Bronx. People don't even really know where her farmhouse was, except that we, well, the, the Split Rock isn't there, but you know, we know that it was somewhere near the Split Rock. Um, so we know very little about that. But she was only there for one year. She was here for four years. Yep. Maybe one, we have time for one more, one more question. Okay, way in the back there. Really? That's very cool. Yeah, really interesting. Um, d one more question. <laughs> Sorry. Do you know anything about when her uh, legacy was re rehabilitated in Massachusetts, if ever? Well, I mean, we, the, the statue was, the one I showed you was, um, it was made by women in, in uh, trying to celebrate the, their getting the right to vote in the late 19-teens, and then it was given as a gift to the Boston Public Library. They refused it, and um, somehow they, the, they were allowed to put it in front of the Massachusetts State House, but the State House didn't want it, and they never dedicated it. So I, you know, it was a little embarrassing, and um, and then we actually I was present at the ceremony where it was finally dedicated in 2005 because people started to become interested in her again, um, and Michael Dukakis, who had um, revoked her banishment in 1987, um, <laughs> he spoke about her, and then so it was dedicated. Um, I, I mean her, her. Her image may still need to be uh, resurrected in certain ways, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me.